Hello everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we are looking at a viewer question that asks something very fundamental about digital signals and digital bit streams. And that is, what's the difference between frequency and bandwidth? Now this viewer question was left on our video about stubs on vias. And that is an important topic in high speed design once you get to very high data rates. So there's a link to that video in the description. Go check that out and then come back here and follow along with this video. Let's get started. Masa Mizuno writes, thank you for your reply. I am not familiar with frequency range. What do you mean by it will only serve that function at very high frequencies? Is the transmission line with the data rate of 10 gigabits per second considered as very high frequency or very high bandwidth? So this is a great question. And the answer is it's both. The reason is that digital signals have an infinite bandwidth. And when I say they have an infinite bandwidth, what I mean is that the bandwidth extends out to infinite frequencies. So we're gonna do a little bit of math here in this video to explain why that's the case. And then what this means when you have to actually design channels to carry high speed signals that operate at these very fast data rates. So when we say that a digital signal has infinite bandwidth, what we really mean is that that digital signal has its power spectrum spread out all the way from very low frequencies up to infinite frequency. And so you can see this by taking a Fourier transform of a square wave. Now, a fundamental way to represent a digital bit stream is just as a simple square wave that is oscillating between two levels. Here we have our zero level, which we could just define as zero volts. Here we have our high level, which we could define as five volts, or we could define it as 3v3 or 1v8, whatever the logic level has to be. So I'm just gonna write high here to illustrate the high logic level. Now in Fourier series, what we're doing is we are representing this digital signal using an equivalent sum of sines and cosines. So this digital signal, f of t, is actually just written as a sum of a bunch of sines and cosines. And so your job in calculating what a Fourier series is, is to solve for all of these different values of these a sub zeros, a sub n, b sub n, and then the omega sub n terms. So there are integral relations that are used for this, and these omega sub n terms are given by n pi divided by t, which is this capital T, is this period right here. So this is our capital T, so this is our repetition period. Using all this and a few integral relations, you can then figure out what all of these coefficients are. So essentially what you're doing is you're just adding up a bunch of sines and cosines with progressively higher frequencies. So if we were to then draw out the power spectrum for this digital signal or this bit stream, it would look something like this, where we basically have a large peak stuck here right at F1, and then we would have another large peak at the next highest f, and so on and so forth, all the way out to f sub n. And they just progressively die off as you get farther and farther in the frequency domain. Now, technically, n goes to infinity. So there's an infinite number of frequencies that are required to perfectly reconstruct this square wave. That's why we say that a digital signal has infinite bandwidth because the equivalent frequencies that I would have to add up in order to construct this square wave is going to span all the way out to infinity. So this is a fundamental mathematical theorem. It's not just used for reconstructing square waves. Technically, any repetitive signal can be represented by this sum of an infinite number of sines and cosines. This is something very fundamental that you actually learn in college math classes and it's something that we do as physicists and mathematicians have to do it, and it's used in a variety of areas of mathematics. But it becomes very important in digital systems design because now we have to know how many of these frequencies does my digital channel have to transmit between a driver and a receiver in order for that channel to work correctly. 
So that's what we're going to look at next. How do we actually get the right amount of frequencies over to our receiver in our channel for that channel to work properly? Now, when we draw out this square wave, typically we've just assumed that there's an instantaneous transition between the low level and the high level. However, in reality, that's not how digital signals work. In reality, there's actually a rise time that is associated with these signal transitions. And so this rise time also determines what the power spectrum looks like. So here I've slowed down this edge rate so that it's not instantaneous. And so generally what happens is that when the rise time is faster, there will be more power concentrated out to these higher frequencies. So with a faster rise time out to some frequency F sub N, you could have more power concentrated at that one frequency. So this would be with a fast edge. This other peak here at a given frequency F sub N would be for our slower edge. So this is very important because you need to be able to transmit more bandwidth at lower frequencies when you have a faster edge rate. And what I mean by that is you need to make sure that you have more power concentrated within a given band limit when this edge rate is faster. Next, what we need to look at is how much bandwidth does a channel need for a given data rate? Because so far, all we've done is we've just taken an arbitrary digital bit stream and we've looked at some examples of what its Fourier spectrum might look like. Then what we need to do is link that back to an actual data rate because there is a bandwidth limit that you can define for a given data rate. So now what we need to do is make the connection between the characteristics of our signal in terms of its power spectrum, as well as the amount of bandwidth that a channel needs in order to receive a signal with a given data rate. When we had our uh, bit stream that we looked at earlier, we can basically draw out its power spectrum as looking something like this. And this is basically just an overlaid envelope that shows how the power spectrum dies out as a function of frequency. So when we have our faster edge rate, the power spectrum looks something a little more like this, meaning we have more power spread out into higher frequencies. So this is our fast signal, and then this is our slow signal. There's a signal that we define called the Nyquist frequency. So we're just going to call this F sub N. This is the Nyquist frequency. And this is important because for a given data rate, this defines the minimum amount of bandwidth that a channel needs in order to receive this bit stream. The Nyquist frequency, F sub N, is gonna be equal to the data rate divided by the number of signal levels, N. So if we have, let's say, RZ or NRZ signaling, which is two levels, we then have N equal to two. If we have PAM4, which is gonna be much more advanced and a higher level of technology, we then have N equal to four. So let's just say for a moment that our data rate is 112 gigabits per second, and we're doing this with a PAM4 format. So N equals four signal levels. That means our Nyquist frequency is 28 gigahertz. So that means that whatever channel I put onto my PCB, it has to be able to transmit 28 gigahertz worth of power down to that receiver. And so what I mean by that is, we need to have low loss up to 28 gigahertz so it can transmit all of the power up to 28 gigahertz down to that receiver. So you can make these definitions for really any bit rate that you want and for any signaling format that you want. NRZ or RZ, which are return to zero and non-return to zero, and then PAM4, these are signaling formats that are commonly used with networking and at very high data rate channels. So when you start getting into those uh, 56 and higher gigabit per second data rates. So I mentioned that in order for a channel to be able to transmit a 112 gigabit per second data rate or any other data rate, 
it needs to have minimal loss within some bandwidth. So how do we quantify that loss? Well, we do that with S parameters. So S parameters are gonna be the standard tool that we use to quantify loss in high speed analysis and signal integrity. So if I were to look at the S parameters for a channel, I would be looking at, of course, S11 or the return loss, which essentially tells me the amount of power reflected from the input of my high speed channel. And then I would also wanna look at S21, which is my insertion loss. And this tells me how much power is lost during the propagation from my input port to my output port. So these are both functions of frequency. In order for a channel to be able to transmit at this 112 gigabit per second with PAM4 signaling, so a PAM4 signaling format, what I need to make sure is that however the channel is designed, it is able to have very low S11, so below negative 10 dB, up to at least the Nyquist frequency F sub N. In order for my channel to be able to transmit a 112 gigabit per second bitstream using this signaling format, then the curve needs to sit somewhere in this region. So my S11 curve needs to be sitting somewhere in this region. So generally these curves will look something like this. They generally will have this kind of structure and then will increase over frequency. So as long as I'm below that negative 10 dB limit, then there is a very good chance that this channel will qualify and comply with whatever interface I am using to transmit this bit rate. Now to really tell whether or not you're going to actually be successful in sending this data stream over that channel, you need to look at an eye diagram, you need to then calculate a bit error rate, you of course need to qualify termination at the far end, and then you need to look at the eye opening in the eye diagram. So there are a few other things that you need to do, but this is really your first step for qualifying a channel to make sure that it is going to be able to transmit at this very high bit rate. Now, of course, the associated curve to this S11 curve is your insertion loss. So your insertion loss curve will generally look something like this, and it's basically just an exponential decrease. Ideally, it will be linear if you only have the dielectric loss, it curves over a bit like this because of the conductor loss. We have two sources of loss that are essentially built into this curve. We have the copper or the conductor loss due to roughness as well as just the skin effect. And then we also have the dielectric loss, which is quantified using the loss tangent. So we have both of the sources of loss built into this. So you will generally have some insertion loss target, which is gonna limit the usable length. And then that can be determined from this S21 curve. In terms of the bandwidth that we need in a channel in order to transmit a given data rate, you look at the Nyquist frequency. That's gonna define the amount of bandwidth that this channel needs to support in order to transmit this given data rate. So go back to your 10 gigabit per second data stream. What is the signaling format that's being used? If you know the signaling format and you know the data rate, you can then figure out what is the Nyquist frequency for that channel. All of this starts to really become important really once you get above five gigahertz channel bandwidth requirements. So the five gigahertz limit is not a hard and fast limit, but this is when you start to notice effects on bandwidth from things like the copper roughness, as well as vias. So vias add in their own forms of loss into these structures. Those are some topics that we'll talk about in an upcoming video, and we'll even do a demo on eye diagrams, and we'll be able to look at some of these uh, effects of losses on closure in an eye diagram, and that's a demo that we'll do in Symbior. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, and of course, keep leaving your comments and questions in the comment section. I love getting your comments and questions. I'm a little behind on questions right now because we've been getting a ton of them ever since the new year, but keep leaving those, and I will try to get to them as best I can. Thanks for watching, everybody, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.